Okay, this is Paul Gregg. Today I'm going to talk about uh, my heavy cart static test. Uh, somewhere in the middle of this about a year ago, I wanted to really find out what the capability of my PVC track and newly welded cart was, so I, I did some heavy cart testing. Um, it was a year ago. I apologize if I get confused a little bit at certain points, but I'm just going to try to get this uh, documented. So the reason for doing this is to, I really want to know how how safe things are and how much margin I've got on on strength and stuff. Now, some of my the parts of my track and my cart are pretty easy to analyze. Uh, anybody with a college level. Uh, engineering degree in a strength and materials course can do this. But one feature was the uh, the joint between the PVC track and the uh, wooden tie uh, with the two three and a half inch number 10 screws. That's a difficult thing to just analyze. In technical industries like uh, like aerospace where I worked, you'd use what's called a finite element model to analyze uh, important features of your you know, airplane parts. Uh, basically, uh, you can look at you can look that up online. What a finite element model is. Basically, it's little tiny elements that uh, have material properties in them and transfer load from one to the other. And there's a big complex uh, codes that solve the math for this. Um, and then they come in different complexity. Here's an example I got off the web. Here's a, a bridge that looks like it, this is just deflections. Of course, a bridge deflects more out in the middle than than at the ends. So, uh, and then here's a, like, obviously it looks like the front of a forklift where the load is out here going down on the forks and there's high stresses here. So they, they've colored the high stresses, uh, red and obviously, so, so engineers use this a lot in, in industry, um, to find out if they're making the, the parts thick enough and, and, uh, how much load they can take and things like that. And final models are used for much more complex things than that. You can decide what the temperatures are at a certain point in time uh, in, a, in a structure. You can do dynamic modeling um, where the elements, uh, element properties are what we call nonlinear. Uh, they change with, uh, for a different strain, the, the properties changed. It can we get very complex. It can involve friction between parts and all kinds of things. But I didn't have, I don't have access to a code like that at home and, and, uh, you can, if you're interested in this, it's a it's a very interesting career just to do this 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 uh, finite element modeling. Um, so when you don't have finite element models, and even when you do, sometimes it's just easier to build and test something. Like I want to know how strong this joint is between the PVC track and my wooden tie. I have two screws pointed at an angle down. Um, and so why not just uh, build up with some little test specimens like this and push on them until they break? I can find out a lot from that, and I don't have to go through the rigorous analysis. And sometimes that, that's what we do in aerospace, too, is we just do a bunch of element-level tests to find out how strong something is. And even if we do uh, nonlinear uh, or linear uh, finite element modeling, we do some some level of uh, element level test to, to see if the model's working right to calibrate the analysis. So basically, I started with these two specimens and and I said, well, what if the wheels are right over the middle of the two screws and what if the wheel loading is, is uh, over just one of the screws? How strong is that joint? And I took this to a professional uh, test lab with these, these are big machines that basically push and pull on something. This is, I think, a hundred thousand pound uh, test machine. Set it in there and just have this head, this hydraulic head, push down and keep track of the load and the deflection, and then until it breaks, and that's what it did. So you can see, I did two tests where the uh, the wheel. This represents the wheel, this aluminum bar, where the wheel is centered between the two fasteners, and I got a thousand pounds of load before this happened. It broke. It looks like a failure of the wood under the screws. Uh, 1,001 pounds in one test, 1,135 pounds in another test that was supposed to be identical. 
uh, the different different values here, obviously, because the wood is different. You know, there's a lot of variability in wood and, and just where the screw sits on there. So that's another important engineering concept is dealing with the variability of, of my materials and my assembly. And I'll talk about that more in a minute, why I did this bigger test. It's really the subject of this, uh, this presentation. Uh, when, that, when I put the, the, the bar right over one fastener, I got a lower load. This broke at a lower load. And that's uh, obviously because the, the load was concentrated not over two fasteners, but it was concentrated on one fastener. So I wasn't really satisfied with this because in reality, the wheels can be anywhere between a tie or near a tie or right over the tie. And so I'd have to do lots and lots of this testing to get a, uh, to get a reasonable answer. And so I kind of scaled up to what I call the um, heavy cart test. I assembled a 10 foot section of track and then I rolled it uh, back and forth across there. I put a lot of weight on it. Uh, I think uh, I was trying to get 900 pounds on it. And I'll tell you why. I was. You know, that seems like a lot of weight, but I'll tell you why it, it, it's in the ballpark of what we should be looking at. So I, I tested a whole bunch of different positions as I did this. Um, I won't go through all of this. Um, you can read it if you want to. But uh, basically, I'm just trying to get through this a little quicker. So uh, for a minute, I'll talk about, I won't go through this in detail either, but we, in engineering, we have what's called a factor of safety. We have our design limit load, which is the maximum load we expect to ever be put onto our, our structure. Uh, the heaviest person we want to take on our, on our backyard roller coaster. And then we have a factor of safety. And then, uh, and then we have what we're going to, the, the loads that are our ultimate loads that we're really going to make sure that it's to, that we can take. Factor safety in aerospace is one and a half. So basically, if you have a 100-pound rider, you want to be testing to 150 pounds. Uh, now, the, the factor safety, why do we do that? Uh, there's a lot of sources of variability in, in what we're doing in engineering, engineering project. And for me, it's, you know, the, I don't know the, the, how, how good these fasteners are uh, from one to the next. Uh, the fastener insulation parameters, over torquing it, under torquing it, the hole size, the hole depth, the countersink depth, and everything. Those are all variables, and I, I can't. I'm you know, the tighter I control those, the less variability I have. But there's some things you don't have control over, like um, the, the grain of the wood, how strong is it at any given point. That's a, a very quite a variable uh, material property. So the PVC, different batches have different strengths. The steel I'm using, different batches of steel have different strength within some tolerance zone. And especially the wood, um, how strong that is uh, varies a lot. So I have to account for that in some way. And that's what a factor of safety does for me. Um, also in the track design and, and the assumptions for my loading, I've got variability. Um, I say that the cart weighs so much, but it might be trying to tilt over. Uh, the wheels in the back might have more load on them than the wheels in the front. And all of those things are uh, sources of uh, variability for, for my load, even understanding what my loads are. In aerospace, like I said, the factor of safety is typically 1.5 for commercial planes, military planes. Um, uh, they want to go faster and be lighter, so they might use a lower factor of safety. And in uh, unmanned military planes and missiles, they use even a lower factor of safety because higher performance is needed and you need to be lighter, so you're willing to cut it closer. Now, so we're now here. This is our, uh, our roller coaster cart. Here's our track cross-section of it. Here's one source of variability is that... Uh, as you're going around a, t uh, a turn, it's not always going to be optimum to where all the load is going straight down toward the track. You're going to have some uh, roll where you're trying to, you know, where the center of gravity is trying to go, be pushing, pushing you sideways, and that's going to result in a moment down on the track. Um, gravity and the centripetal forces will always go toward the track if you've de designed it right or but then if you're trying to if if you're trying to 
going around a turn and there's some side load, then that's going to add load to one side and subtract load to the other track. So there's some variability there. And as a general rule, I just said there's another 1.25 to 1 1.5 factor safety just because of that. I don't want to have to figure out the loads for all of those things, which would be a very difficult thing. If it was a professional roller coaster, yeah, you'd do that. But uh, the other, another source of variability in my in knowing my loads is uh, I don't have my center of gravity directly over both wheels all the time. You kind of because there's a reason for wanting to get the weight near the back end. The back wheels are the ones that react the overturning roll moment, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, so there's some you know some percentage the front wheels are generally going to be less loaded than the back wheels and so that's another factor uh, when I'm just talking about how strong it is for one wheel to be loading the track in one place I add another 1.25 factor safety to account for that variable so here's what I'm really trying to get to is I decided to stack a lot of weight on the cart and run it down a 10 foot section of track that was built uh, the way I'm, I'm building these tracks um and that that what that does is it when the see i have no way of knowing if it's the worst case if the wheels are between the ties or if the wheels are right over the ties it's probably worst case for the for the track itself for the pipe when the uh, wheel is in the middle of the track because the bending moments are higher at either end uh, and that may affect the fasteners too so without knowing that best to cover all the bases by building a track putting a real heavy cart on it and rolling it down now so each one of these storage containers that i put on here if you fill them with water they weigh 225 pounds each each so four of them would weigh 900 pounds and that's what i'm calling my ultimate load and you think well 900 pounds i'm just a i'm just a 150 pound person how am i why am i talking about 900 pounds but when you think about it uh, a 200 pound person if if you're going through a 3g dip then you really weigh 600 pounds for a little bit of time while you're going through there and if you add a one and a half factor of safety on that for all these variables i'm talking about then all of a sudden you're at 900 pounds it's it's not so it is a reasonable number for a static test trying to simulate a dynamic environment so uh, that's basically what the test, uh, what my design of the test looked like. Uh, I did, you know, thrown factors of safety and I had a 2.81 factor of safety on a, with a 150 pound or 140 pound passenger and a 25 pound cart. So basically this is what the test looks like. I think there's a video of this on my YouTube channel. Um, it was very, you know, the first, it was easy for a while. I used water because then when I get it loaded up, it's easy to siphon the water out. If I if I put sand in there, then I would get up to a certain uh, weight. Maybe something would break, and I'd have this 900-pound column of sand that I'd be trying to avoid. Uh, so I used, did use water. I probably should have used sand in the bottom bucket because the weight of the top buckets were buckling the sides of this lower storage container. And that kind of limited me to 830 pounds, I think, instead of the 900 I wanted. But still, 830 pounds is a lot. It was about to tip over there and look like the bottom bucket was going to buckle. So I put eight, I filled it up until that point. Um, I, it's really a calculated value for the water because I, I uh, saw how, how high it was in here and what the volume is. And so then I knew the weight of the water in the bucket. I think I did weigh one bucket with water in it and verified, yeah, 225 pounds of water fills a bucket so uh basically the test is fill it up as much as you can i was kind of holding on to it because it was starting to tip over and then i rolled it down the the track and it uh it didn't break at all uh, it'd be nice to have a break but i at this point it's nice to know that you can take 830 pounds on just four wheels not eight wheels this was a four wheel track four wheel cart and then I know per wheel what the, the track and the joint between the pipe and the tie, what that limit is. I know that it's that it's least a, at least 830 pounds divided by four. Um, and if I wanted to carry higher G's or carry higher weight passengers, then I could redo this test and then put sand in the bottom and put a heavier substances in, in here than water and, and go up higher. 
but I know that uh, this is this is how, how what my capability is with this design. I also track the deflections here, uh, not in a real accurate way, but it, uh, that helps you understand if your analysis is uh, tracking with uh, reality. So that's the test. And uh, tells me how, really, it tells me without any doubt how strong this uh, track is. And, and then I can have some safety. Um, important to, uh, to look at everything after the test. There were some things that were permanently deflected. Uh, the plastic in the, in the storage container had come down and driven itself into a screw. That's not a, it's too big of an importance. But um, I have these little casters on this cart little uh, casters on the wheels and uh, one of the grade two bolts that was holding it together did bend. I think both of them bent on the back side. And uh, what that tells you is those bolts are not good enough. Um, they're easy to replace though. So here's my conclusions. Uh, the heavy cart tests were successful, successful with an ultimate load of at least 130 pounds and a factor of safety of 2.81 which is one and a half times one and a half times 1.25. Limit load would be 295 pounds. And uh, uh, if, I'm, if I'm designing a track that's uh, 1.962 Gs, which is what this was looking like at the time, then uh, I can take a 150 pound rider and cart. Just a 150 pound rider. Um, there's only one high G section of this track that I was currently building at the time, which is my big track, the, the middle track, the uh, three-dimensional track. And in those high G sections, uh, I decided I'd double, the, double up the, the ties, put a tie between each tie, so there's only about eight inches between ties. And then that uh, gives me a lot of confidence that it, those, none of the screws are going to break when... Uh, even if I have higher G's than that. And I did end up having higher G's than that. I'll talk about that in a different presentation. And then I decided to replace those uh, grade two um, caster pivot bolts, which are only 57 KSI yield strength, uh, with the grade eight bolts, which are much better bolts, 130 KSI. So I solved that bolt bending problem. And, uh, interesting to note, side note, if you do, you know, it's always good to use these grade eight bolts where the, Designs critical. If you weld onto those grade eight bolts, you destroy the heat treat, and they are not strong anymore. So, if you're going to use grade eight bolts, don't weld on them. Um, and then I have a re couple recommendations. This this method could be used for if I come up with a new, and I have since thought of better uh, fastener methods for the track to the tie. Uh, I could use this same method to do that. And then there's some notes that uh, you can read, but uh, don't won't go through now. But basically, that's the the uh, what I, the message I wanted to convey today with this uh, heavy cart static load test. That's what uh, that's a, uh, one of the things engineers do to make sure things are safe and that they know what's going on. So thanks for watching.